friends good evening everybody so today i welcome you all for the session 4 of human health and diseases so it's a continuation like we saw what is health we saw what is disease we saw various agents the pathogens that causes the diseases so in today's class we are going to focus on a different set of pathogens and what are the diseases they are going to cause so in today's class again we are going to see some common diseases and the causing agents so in today's class we are going to see about the interesting fungal infections the fungal diseases and then we are going to see the pyron infection and the protozoal infection all this will be the topic for today so now let us start with fungal diseases now what you understand by fungal disease the fungal disease like everybody at least once in their lifetime would have encountered with this fungal disease this fungal disease actually it is going to affect your skin probably the hair and the nail okay so it is going to affect what we call the keratinized tissue so the fungal disease as you see here yes the fungal diseases okay in humans we are talking about is caused by the infection of the fungi which we collectively call it as mycosis now this fungal disease okay as you see what happens it is going to affect the particular set of epithelial tissue the keratinized tissue what do you mean by keratinized tissue the hair nail and the skin so what are all the fungi that affects this keratinized tissue you call them as dermatophytes derma means what skin so if we get a skin issue which physician are we going to the dermatologist yes so what is derma we are talking about the skin so what happens these fungal diseases the fungal diseases collectively you call them what is called the dermatomycosis the dermatomycosis okay okay so that is very 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 important so you should know that the fungal diseases they are caused by the fungal infections which is particularly going to affect the keratinized tissue and the infections we collectively call what we call it as the dermatomycosis now what are these fungi we have the microsporum we have the trichophyton and the epidermophyton so these are the main classes of the fungi which is going to affect the keratinized tissue this microsp microsporum okay so this microsporum will affect only the hair and skin the trichophyton will affect all hair skin and nails what about epidermophyton it will affect the skin nail not the hair so this is the difference that we make up so microsporum trichophyton and epidermophyton microsporum is specific for hair skin what about trichophyton it affects all the keratinized tissue what about epidermophyton it affects only the skin and the nail so then uh, we have to know the best example which we can give is the ringworms i hope everybody would have heard about it so what is ringworm usually in our medical school we use the term what is called the tinea the tinea is the name that we give for the ringworm so these ringworms or the dermatophytes that is the fungi which causes the skin infections they are going to live on the dead layer of the keratin protein and what is going to happen the temperature the heat moist they are going to support the fungal growth 
so that is why they are very commonly like you can see it infect the skin folds particularly the axilla the groin and all that so what are the symptoms we are going to see there is appearance of dry scaly lesions on the skin nails and scalp as you look into this picture you see there is an indurating a margination reddish in color yes and it's very dry scaly okay so that is one which develops either on the skin or on the nail or on the scalp and there is another one which i would like to tell you what we call it as candidiasis this candidiasis is caused by candida albicans it's a fungi which causes this disease which is called candidiasis what it uh, candidiasis means oral thrush okay so what it, it is this candidiasis is going to be the disease that is going to be the disease that will occur in people particularly when their immune system is compromised so the best example when the immune system is compromised we think about the aids patient those who are infected with hiv their immune system is going to be compromised so the first thing they develop lot of fungal infections and one among that is called the candidiasis so what collectively we give the name we call that as opportunistic opportunistic infections so what are opportunistic infections the infections that is going to occur in the person that is when his immune system is going to be weakened so he is giving a way for all the infections to affect him so particularly the fungal infection and there are a lot of fungal infections but the most commonest is the candidiasis which will occur in the hiv infected patient or any immune compromised person we call such type of infection as opportunistic infection i hope you all understood okay so that is called the opportunistic infections now how can you treat it we have a lot of antifungal agents that is going to prevent the development or prevent uh, what you call instead of prevent it's going to treat the fungal disease we have candida like we have what is called clotrimazole we have lot array of antifungal drugs depending on the scenario we are going to prescribe then what is the prevention the best thing is the hygiene maintenance so what happens like sharing of combs or undergarments or clothing mostly so those personal items so that could be a reason and regular bathing and uh, make taking care of their own hygiene personal hygiene is something that it can prevent them from contracting these fungal infections so i started with fungal disease today students okay so in fungal disease what is that infection whatever that we call it as the mycosis the one that is going to cause infection is mycosis since it is invading your skin you call that as the dermatophyte and that which cause the disease are dermatomycosis we have three array of see again it is an mcq important question they can ask you like microsporum it affects the hair skin please all of you note it down as i say because it's very important and at the same time all these usually biology looks very easy but it is a volatile subject you need to keep on remembering the concept otherwise it is very difficult so please take a paper and pen and just write down certain points which i say it is important so we have what is the the microsporum the trichophyton all the skin hair nail and the epidermophyton so it is going to affect the skin nail only so the ring worms which we so that's another important question tinea okay so which part the keratinized tissue so which is going to promote the heat and moisture that's another question so they can ask you like what is opportunistic infection and among that what is is a candidiasis so this is where you have to recall the concept next we are going to see about the disease that is caused by the pyrions what are pyrions the pyrions are nothing but they are the proteinaceous infective particles okay so they are the abnormal tertiary proteins that is particularly you can see they are present in the nerve cells and leukocytes so they are supposed to be 
something very infective particles that are present where in the nerves as well as in the leukocytes. Now you should understand another scenario there is something we say there is going to be an abnormal folding of proteins okay in this particularly caused by the pyreons and they are going to bring about certain degenerative changes in the organ where it is getting affected. So this is governed by the gene which is located in the 20th chromosome and that is important. So who discovered this disease? So this was discovered by Stanley Fruisner who has discovered this pyreons as one of the causative agent that causes the pyreon infections. Okay. So what are pyreons? They are just protein but infective protein and they are going to have the target where the nerve cell and the leukocytes and their gene for that is located in the 20th chromosome. Okay. So the disease of the pyreons you see here it's very interesting like it is the crew. What is this crew? It is actually called the laughing death. They say that here this crew is actually incurable disease, a neurodegenerative disease where it uh, brings about a type of spongy encephalopathy. It affects the brain we say. Spongy form, form of encephalopathy which is a disease that affects the brain. Okay. So here you can see that the person comes with the symptoms of tremors. Tremors means the shakiness. Okay. So they have tremors, loss of coordination because it affects the cerebellum. So what role the cerebellum uh, is going to control that functions are going to get lost. So they will develop tremors and they will have what you call the loss of coordination and all that. So it is a neurodegenerative disease. It is quite characteristic present in a particular uh, set of people who belong to this New Guinea where they are cannibals. Okay, they heat the particularly following the funeral and they say it is quite common in women and children where they eat okay, the brains of the dead persons. So we call that as ritual cannibalism following that funeral they used to eat. So that is how they are contracting that infection. So what is happening in this Kuru? So that pyreon is going to change the folding of those proteins, bringing about a degenerative change, incurable degenerative change in the cerebellum resulting in death of the person. And what about this? I think uh, in the acronomans we told you, Kruzfeld jacob disease, CJD usually we call. So the CJD is something which affects the cerebral cortex. Again, this is also a pyreon infected, yes. And this is also a neurodegenerative disorder. So here also the person, okay, there are variants are there. Like we have a classical CJD, we say, okay. And then we have a variant CJD. Here mostly the person will come with the presentation of dementia, memory loss. Okay, and then they will have a loss of coordination, visual disturbances, etc. But what about variant? They will have psychiatric behavioral changes. So that is very characteristic. So even in this picture, you can see the characteristic of what is happening there. There the proteins, they are getting accumulated up. Abnormal tertiary proteins, they are affecting either the nerve cells or the muscle cell that is the WBCs. So that is characteristic. So they can ask you in the exam, Cruise fall, Jacob disease. It's a pyreon infected. It's a neurodegenerative. Mostly affect the neurons. Mostly affect the leukocytes. Here the target is cerebral cortex. It's a form of what we call the spongy encephalopathy. Spongy form encephalopathy. It's a disorder that affects the brain. Yes, now we are going for the question session. Yes, students. Okay, all cheer up. I wanted everybody to come in the chat. Give your interactive response for this. Pyreons are infectious substances which mostly affect nerve cell. As you see here, nerve cell, muscle cell, connective tissue, bones. What is the answer? Yes, come on. Please put it in the chat. I am waiting.
Yes, students, please put the answers in the chat. I am waiting. The question is repeated. Pyrions are infectious substances which mostly affect the nerve cells, muscle cells, connective tissue, bones. What is the answer? Yes, students, yes, come on. Nidarshana, Revati. Yes, come on. Anandita. Yes, what are the answers? Please put it in the chat. Okay. Okay, let me share the answer. Okay, so the answer would be The answer is the nerve cells, okay, because already I told you that they are abnormal tertiary proteins, okay, so that is present in the nerve cells and leukocytes. So the pyrions, they are going to affect the nerve cells because it is not affecting either the other tissues, the bones or muscles, its main target is what, the nerve cells. Now we are going to go to the next interesting part of it which is the protozoan diseases. So we will see what are these protozoan diseases. Can anybody name some protozoan diseases? Yes. Yes, please name some protozoan diseases. Yes, name some protozoan diseases. Yes, excellent students, you answered. Very good. Name some protozoan diseases. Name some protozoan diseases. Yes, I found everybody answering. Very good. Yes, excellent. Revati, Lakshmi, very good. Malaria, then anything else? Yes, trypanosoma, excellent Nidarshana, Shivani, very good. So, sleeping sickness, malaria, trypanosoma, these were some of the disease which you all gave. And with this introduction, we will just pass on to the protozoan diseases. Malaria, if at least we would have experienced this fever once in the lifetime or we would have heard about like either our friend getting it or one in a family Somewhere we would have come across it's such a common, common, common disease we see in most of the tropical areas. So when I say malaria, okay, when I say malaria, it was actually derived from the Italian word mala, which they said foul and area, which means air. So they thought this malaria was probably coming up because of some, uh, what you call, there was uh, some uh, marshy lands from that that some foul smelling air that caused the malaria but all these thoughts were erased by the person i hope you all know which i'll be showing in the forthcoming slide we have the ronald rose he was the pioneer who did a lot of study in this malaria and he found that that mosquito is the culprit who is bringing this disease so, it is a mosquito borne disease, okay. Another credit goes to Charles Lavran. So, he is another pioneer who said that this protozoan parasite, the plasmodium, it was discovered by this Charles Lavran. He, he was the pioneer and this parasite is infecting the men through the vector. The mosquito was found by Ronald Rose. So, you have to be very careful. Ronald Rose contribution was finding the vector, the mosquito bite. What about the protozoa for that causes the ma malaria? It is the Charles Lavin. So, when you take humans, usually 
they are infected with any of these four species. We have Plasmodium falciparum. I hope students you will be knowing these names falciparum, Plasmodium vivax, Plasmodium ovale, Plasmodium malaria. Suppose you are not know or new to this concept, please take down of this. Yes, children? Yes. Now we will see that the Plasmodium, it enters the uh, human body in the form what we call sporozoids, which is the most infectious form. Again, from the MCQ point, they will ask this question. So the Plasmodium vivax, which is going to infect the human body, how are they going to attack? So, they are going to infect us in the form of sporozoid, which is the infective form. And how they are going to enter our body through the bite of that female anaphylos, those mosquitoes. So, through the mosquitoes, they are going to. So, it is going to be a very simple question they will put forth. Please understand, again I am emphasizing plasmodium entering the body in what form? It is the sporozoids form, infectious form. How it is entering through the mosquito bite? What is the mosquito? It is the female anaphylos mosquito. Now, let me tell you about this uh, falciparum. This falciparum actually when a person is infected, they will become fatal. Like it, what we call this as the cerebral malaria. So, once somebody is getting infected with this falciparum, it is something worldwide it is distributed and it is going to bring about the cerebral malaria. I hope uh, you would have heard about Alexander the Great. Even he died. He was conquering the world. Anybody had the fear to stand in front of the king, Alexander. And he died of what? The cerebral malaria. So, it is so fatal. Okay. So, another thing is the Plasmodium vivax. This Plasmodium vivax, the, uh, the difference I am just telling you. In this species, the person will recur the fever every 48 ga hours gap. So, he will, which we call it as tertian malaria. Every 48 hours, he will develop the symptom. What about uh, the same will be present in the ovale also. But uh, the commonest, the commonest in the tropical area is plasmodium malaria. Here, we call it as quartan malaria, quartan. Why do we say it is caught on malaria? Because here they are going to have a gap of 72 hours. So it is a subclinical also. Sometimes a person will not have symptom at all. So sometimes subclinical. So we have these types of infection. So they might put forth plasmodium, falciparum, cerebral malaria, very fatal. Many names are there. We say black water fever. Uh, pernicious malaria, even they can ask you question like that, pernicious malaria. So it is called cerebral or pernicious malaria, if they are getting infected from plasmodium falciparum. 48 hours gap with that they are developing some symptoms, plasmodium vivax or plasmodium ovale. The commonest among the tropical country malaria, plasmodium malariae, 72 hours gap, quartan malaria we say. So, what is the infectious form? The tropozoites and how it is entering the body through the mosquito bites, female anaphylos. Now, when you look into the life cycle of this malarial parasite, okay, it is actually digenetic. This word is very, very important. What do you mean by digenetic? That means they are going to have two hosts to complete their life cycle. What are the two hosts they are going to have? One is the human, another one is the mosquito. That is why malaria is a digenetic form. They are going to have a digenetic life cycle or that plasmodium itself is a digenetic parasite. Okay. So, what is there in the human? So, human is actually the primary host. Okay. So, the primary host is the humans. What about the mosquito? It is a secondary host. So, here the sexual reproduction, they can ask this question. Sexual reproduction of plasmodium takes place in which host? Mosquitoes. Particularly where it is going to take place in the gut, gut of the mosquito. So, we are having two host. That is why we are calling that as the digenetic parasite. The first host is the human. 
it affects the liver and rbc okay but what about the mosquito it is a secondary host but in the gut of the mosquito the sexual reproduction takes place so question can come like that also let me see about the life cycle of the plasmodium okay now first see see this mosquito that female aniflos mosquito yes it's coming and biting up what is going to happen it is going to inject this infectious form the sporozoids into the body and it is going to reach the liver okay it is going to reach the liver once when it is entering into our body we will have two phases in the life cycle one is called hepa hepa means i told it's liver hepatic schizogony another one is called the erythrocytic that means what what is erythrocyte what are erythrocytes oh schizogony what are erythrocytes the erythrocytes are the rbcs so what is going to happen they they are going to affect the liver and the rbc so now once when the sporozoids it is there in the salivary glands of these mosquitoes they are going to bite once when it enters first it will be the hepatic schizogony okay it goes to the liver in the liver it is going to convert itself into tropo trophozoite it is called the trophozoite now this trophozoite is going to be converted into what we call it as the schizon schizon is actually it is a, a fully uh, packed up of those cells and it is going to undergo what is called schizogony it's a form of multiple fission where there will be more nucleated cells inside but the cytoplasmic division would have not occurred and at one point what will happen this schizons will rupture once when they rupture they release what is called the merozoids or the cryptozoids there are many names for every stage but okay they release the merozoids or the cryptozoids now what happens these in the liver these merozoids that cryptozoids okay they again go infect the liver where they form what is called the meta cryptozoids now this meta cryptozoids will have either micro cryptozoids or the mega cryptozoids the micro form of this cryptozoids or the merozoids will infect the rbc the rest will again go and infect the liver back attack the liver and there will be lot of schizon formation and again merozoids will come that formation of meta cryptozoid or merozoids will keep on coming so this is what is going to happen so that micro form of the cryptozoids okay they will attack the rbc now once when they enter the rbc you know that it has got the tasty hemoglobin in it and all that it will start consuming it it will form the tropozoids now this tropozoids will have lot of divisions and it is going to form the schizon that is the schizogony many multiple fission more nucleated cell and that entire thing is called the schizon now this schizon is going to rupture and it is going to release what are called the gametophyte the gametocytes are nothing but where the gametocyte formation will occur that is we have what is the male uh, gametocyte which we call the micro which is called the micro gametocyte and then we have the macro gametocyte so what will happen uh, the micro gametocyte is actually the uh, male the macro gametocyte is the female so those gametocytes are formed there in the rbc so they can ask you like these questions which i will again emphasize you after finishing the entire life cycle okay so now we have uh, see now once when the mosquito comes and bites that infected person that gametocytes is going to enter into the mosquito in the mosquito we have three main stages one is called gametogenesis what do you mean by gametogenesis there is formation of the gametes the micro gametocyte the macro gametocyte then we are going to have the next step is fertilization so what is fertilization the fertilization is the union of the male and the female gamete so the zygote is formed now this zygote is getting converted itself into what we call oocyanate 
the O kinate will be covered with an encapsulation we call that as O cyst. This O cyst will first have a meiotic division then lot of mitotic division and it is going to form the sporozoids. Actually we have sporoblast then sporozoids. You remember like that sporozoids. So please children take it like a flow chart so that you will not forget. Okay. Again I am going to explain. Have a paper and a pen and please jot it down of what I am telling you. Okay. Okay. So we will see this. See once when the mosquito with that infective form what we call the sporozoids when it bites us it is going to enter the liver there it is getting converted to tropo trophozoid okay everybody have written very good now they are going to undergo that division and form what is called the schizon this schizon will undergo the division and it is going to form the cryptozoids or the merozoid the merozoid again will go affect the liver and lot of uh, what you call the meta cryptozoids will be formed from the meta cryptozoid we have the micro form the smaller version will affect the rbc so now in the rbc they attack the hemoglobin the trophozoids will be formed they have lot of stages and schizoin is formed from the schizoin there will be release okay of these uh, gametocytes okay so micro and macro the micro is the male and macro is the female gametocytes are formed once again when the mosquito bites that infected person what happens it, it is taken up by the blood that meal okay whenever it comes and takes up and then uh, we have the three stages what we have the gametogenesis the fertilization and then we have another stage called the sporogenesis that is the sporozoid formation sporogony we say we say the sporogony actually so here the gametogenesis the gamete formation occurs Fertilization, union of male and female gamete occurs, the zygote is formed, then the next step is called the ukinate. Now the ukinate is again, so after the fertilization we have the ukinate, from the ukinate we have the encapsulated oocyst which will undergo a lot of mitotic division to form the infective sporozoids which will be residing in the salivary glands of the mosquito. All are able to follow this, yes, yes students. Yes, that is why we call that as hepatic schizogony and erythrocytic schizogony. So, this is the entire life cycle. There is one more term we use what is called the pre-pattern period. That is, pre-pattern period is once when the mosquito bite, okay, the time interval between the mosquito bite and the uh, presence of that uh, plasmodium in the blood, we call that as pre-pattern period. Depending on the type of our uh, plasmodium species, the variation will be there. The most fast will be plasmodium falciparum, only 5 days because it will have no uh, pre-erythrocytic uh, schizoconia and all will not be there. So, only 5 days, so it is supposed to be. Malaria and all 15 days, okay. But incubation period is different from the bite till the person develops the symptoms, okay, like fever, chills and all. So, that is incubation period. Pre-pattern period is the mosquito bite till the parasite is appearing in the blood. So, that is called pre-pattern period. So, you are all able to follow everybody. Yes. Shall we move on to the next slide? I hope you have taken down the flow chart. Okay. So, remember it is a digenetic and other things. Now, how are we going to control the malaria? Like killing mosquitoes like spraying insecticides or we can apply what is called those oil, oil film like uh, like where they suffocate and die at the larval stage they can plant like spraying the oils or the best way of biological control the biological control we plan what by using the gambusia fish this is also an mcq question they'll ask so gambusia fish is used for what vector control particularly the mosquitoes then prophylactic drugs can be given and malaria like it has been remaining control because uh, like we have the national malaria control programs coming up but since they are becoming resistance to all these repellents sprays even we can use what we call the uh, mosquito nets we can advise that particular uh, people who are uh, having that endemic issues stagnation of water environmental hygiene all that are very important to control the malaria so the malaria treatment so see ronald rose the credit goes to him so, the Malaria Awareness Day is 25th April. 
but 13th May, it, it, his birthday is celebrated as the mosquito day. So, we are celebrating mosquito day also. 13th May, I, anybody de, <laughs> birthday falls on this? Uh, okay. So, 13th May is the mosquito day and uh, 25th April is the malaria awareness day. So, what is the drug of choice? We give quinine and chloroquinine. So, actually these drugs are isolated or they have been extracted from the bark of chinchona which is a tree which is widely present in India and uh, even it is quite commonly uh, found in Sri Lanka also. So, any fever of unknown origin we usually give uh, chloroquinones. Okay, because tropical areas I already said plasmodium malaria which is a subclinical type thinking it in that perspective we give. Then we have other drugs like Pamaquin or we have Daraprim like Primaquin. So these are so Romber, Quinones and Chloroquinones from the bark of Chinchona. So that is important. Okay. Next coming to another interesting, very, very interesting disease called Amoebiasis. Amoebiasis is caused by Entamoeba Estelitica. Please make a note. Okay. So this amoebiasis is something uh, very common in the tropical countries, first point. Second important, it is monogenetic. This entamoeba histolytica is monogenetic. What do you mean by monogenetic? Parasite, it will have only single host and that to humans alone. So it is very specific. Okay. So it is a monogenetic parasite. So that is another important question they can ask you. Now, how is the mode of transmission? The mode of transmission is through fecal oral route, okay, or it can spread through some mechanical vectors like house flies, even cockroaches, and all that. Now, it is a monax monogenes bacteria which is having single man host and it is an asexual generation actually. So, here the person they come with complaints of very severe abdominal pain, they will have cramps. And sometimes they will have uh, dysentery sort of issues, amoebic dysentery, chronic amoebiasis. So that is where they present with the clinical symptom. So let us now look into the life cycle. So amoebiasis caused by entamoeba histolytica. It is a monogenetic parasite which is having only single host that to human only. So, how it is spreading? It is very interesting, right? Today's class is interesting class because we are seeing a vast of all the life cycles. Okay. So, we will see now. See, we have what is called the, the cyst. Okay. So, the cyst whatever is present, the quadrinucleate cyst we say, this is the infectious form. Now, once when it is entering the fecal route, fecal oral route or through some contaminated food or water, okay, so this entamoeba histolytica is entering via cyst. Once when they enter, they are going to form what is called the metacystic form, okay, the metacystic form that is this quadrinucleate cyst is entering via the oral route, achha, coming to the small intestine. Here, because of the enzymatic action, the cyst wall is going to break and it is going to form what is called metacystic form. Now, this metacystic form is the one which is going to enter the colon. Okay. So, here for every one metacyst, we have eight daughter cells form by the division, which we call it as the amoebules. Okay. So, eight daughter cells will be formed from one metacyst. So, like that they will be lodging the entire large intestine. Okay. And then they will invade the walls of the large intestine. So, what we call that as the trophozoites. Now, this trophozoites again through the asexual reproduction where they keep on multiplying and they are going to form the cyst. Okay. Now, sometimes these cysts they can enter the lungs or the liver cause abscess. Sometimes even the brain also or the trophozoites okay they will form like cyst and they are stored here in the fecal matter in fecal matter what happens once when it gets dehydrated all the water is removed what is going to happen it becomes again that cystic form okay the cyst will form and it will be excreted by again back into the uh, environment as the mature cyst 
so that is where you should understand so the best uh, presence we look for tropozoids presence in the stool examination either we do fluorescence uh, antibody test or we do elisa so this is how we do so how what is the life cycle quadrinucleate cyst entering through the fecal oral route okay going into the intestine and stomach where they are degraded by the enzymes the proteolytic enzyme the metacyst is formed this metacyst whatever is going to divide and form the daughter cells these daughter cells keep on multiplying they form the trophozoites the trophozoites again again divide and form the cyst that mature cyst will come out and again the cycle goes on okay so how do we prevent so probably proper hygiene personal hygiene is important and avoid intake of contaminated food water and all that and uh, vector that control of vectors particularly house flies and cockroaches and all that the drug of choice we give metronidazole this is a important drug apart from emetine for the vomiting humatin vimifoam the best drug of choice is flagyl we call metronidazole so this is what we treat for amebiasis i hope you all understood okay shall we move to the next slide then we have what we call it as the leish mania so in leish maniasis it's another characteristic disease okay so here the disease is also called kalazar see the change in the skin color of the person or it is also called dum dum fever so leish maniasis is a chronic disease which is caused by leish mania donavani now here you have to understand one important thing this leish mania donavani has got two people okay who are pioneers in finding it that is why the name is the leish man from london and donavani from chennai madras so they were the two pioneers who were found this unicellular parasitic protozoan and that is why it is named and it is going to cause what is called the leish maniasis again it is a digenetic parasite which i already told you that means it is going to affect the human as well as and uh, it is going to have the life cycle going to have a life cycle one part is in the human the other part is in the sand fly the sand fly is called the flibo flibo thomas so they can ask you flibo thomas causes which type of diseases so they can give you the option so it is the leish maniasis kala hazar we say so what is happening in human we have a very important form what we call the a mastigot so the many names are there a mastigot is the form that is present in the human what about in the sand fly we have what is called the pro mastigoid form so this is where they are present so they are going to affect all the inner lining of the blood vessels the bone marrow spleen liver wbc and all that so this is with leishmaniasis so leishmaniasis is again a protozoal disease it is caused by leishmania donavani here it is a digenetic parasite where one half of the life cycle is going to be in the human and another half of the life cycle is going to be in the sand fly phlebotomus so that is where we have to understand now we'll see that the life cycle of the leishmania donavani so in leishmania donavani you have to know that first which i said that let me start how it is starting here now what happens once when the sand fly bites or gets injected into our body that pro mastigoid form which i said it's present in the sand fly is getting injected up so that is where you have to understand okay so what is happening it is just getting in, um, inserted into the man so in the man what is happening that pro mastigoid is getting converted to the anti uh, what is that called the a mastigoid form okay so in the reticulo endothelial system the wbc cells now this a mastigoid form in the humans is going to enter the all the macrophages where it is undergoing the binary fission it is undergoing the binary fission and uh, in the binary fission what is going to happen like it will have again so many a mastigoids will be produced either they will go affect all the system like the visceral organs or again they will be taken up by the sand fly okay so now in the sand fly this a mastigoid is getting changed into pro mastigoid 
by mainly in the midgut. This is a very important MCQ question. Once they have asked in the AIMS paper. Okay. So, A mastigoid is what? So, the A mastigoid will change into the pro mastigoid form in the midgut. Now, this pro mastigoid will again keep on dividing. Okay. And this pro mastigoid will be there in the foregut. Again, this will inject into the human and the cycle will continue. Please children, make a note of it. Again, I am telling you. See, in the human, the infectious form is the pro mastigoid. Okay, that is from the sand fly, it is injected. Now, it is going to convert into a mastigoid and in the macrophages, there is going to be binary fission where they are divided into many a mastigoid. Okay, that is taking place in the macrophage. Now, these a mastigoid is again taken up by the uh, sand fly. Okay, so this a mastigoid is converted back to pro mastigoid in the midgut. So, again what happens a lot of multiplication takes place and they are going to reside in the foregut and again the cycle continues. So, here the person with comes with a complaint of enlargement of spleen, liver, sometimes uh, darkening of the skin is the main symptom and uh, that is where we see they will have anemia, jaundice and all and the best treatment we give this drug the antimony compounds mostly and then followed by uh, amphotericin and all that. So, this is where we treat the leishmaniasis. So, leishmaniasis caused by leishmania tonavani, digenetic parasite. Then we saw about what is pro mastigoid, the infectious form. Yes, how it is getting divided in the macrophages. Then pro mastigoid is again converted to mastigoid form where? Where it is going to get converted in the mastigoid form. So, in the mastigoid form, it is happening in the foregut then again the cycle continues okay so that is very important why a mastigoid is not destroyed by macrophages see actually their target is going to go affect the they are all actually parasites where they are all new, uh, encapsulated so you can see here these uh, uh, what you call they are going and first itself they are affecting the targeting itself in the macrophages Okay, so the macrophages only to some extent they can protect and after one point what happens they have no other choice and ultimately they are going to give away for their own multiplication. So that is why, so they, uh, they just come in n numbers and they just start destroying all these uh, things like the blood capillaries, the spleen, liver. So all these macrophages are just captured by these uh, A mastigoid. So that is how they are, we are, they are not able to fight against the uh, protozoan, uh, particularly the leishmania. You are able to follow cavia, yes. So then we have the trypanosomiasis, which many of them answered in the beginning, the African sleeping sickness, which is caused by trypanosoma rhodesiae or trypanosoma gambesiae. So trypanosoma uh, miasis means it is African sleeping sickness that is caused by trypanosoma common gambesiae. What is the bite due to? Yes, the I hope uh, Kavya you are able to understand. Yes, that is what I gave the answer like uh, they are not destroyed because the macrophages is a point where they enter and the multiplication probably they are having that resistant uh, cystered form where it is uh, not able to be destroyed by the macrophages. Even we see the tuberculosis infection also, where the macrophages will be a silent viewer. So, same like that. Then we have, what is that? Uh, we have this bite of tesse, tesse fly, that is the one which is causing the African sickness. So, what are the initial symptoms? So, the person will first start with developing fever, shortness of breath, they will have that uh, muscle pain, joint pain, some sort of irritability because it affects the slowly start affecting the CNS. In the later part of the disease, they will have paralysis, confusion and they go for that sleeping state which we call coma and then they die. That is why it is called the African sleeping sickness. So, the bite of the tesse tesse fly which is a carrier of trypanosoma gambesiae brings about this African sleeping sickness. Initially, the person will develop that fever, 
uh, lymph node enlargement and they'll have shortness of breath slowly the neurological symptoms comes in and they go for a long duration of sleep which we say as coma and then they die this is with the african sleeping sickness okay you're able able to follow everybody yes next we see about what are the disease that is caused by elmanthus so before going into it i'm going to ask you one question yes tell me a parasite that is digenetic give an example of a parasite that is digenetic waiting for your answers yes please put it in the chat please put it in the chat Yes, excellent. Malarial parasite, Leishmania, Donavani. Yes, then. I want somebody. Yes, answer. What do you mean by digenetic? The life cycle, it needs two hosts to complete its life cycle. That we call it as digenetic. Okay. So, we will pass on to the next, the disease caused by Helminthus. So students, I want everybody to interact. When I ask a question, I want everybody to put the answers. Then only we'll have a nice, interesting, interactive session. Okay. Yes, very good. Excellent students. Excellent. You're answering. Excellent. Good. Next comes here. Yes. Plasmodium vivax. X. Yes. So here. Yes, we will move on to the next set of disease. Thank you for the response. The disease caused by helminthus, helminthic infections. So this is quite common as presented as ascariasis. So mostly school going children comes here with a presentation of abdominal pain, vomiting, not gaining weight. They are looking very lethargic. These are the complaints we receive. So when we go for the examination, when we do the lot of diagnostic and examination, we come across that they are infestated with nematodes, particularly the roundworm, which we call it as Ascaris lumbricoids. So what is this Ascaris lumbricoids? It is the largest nematode, which is going to reside in the alimentary canal. Now, the male worm will be shorter, nearly around 15 centimeter, our small ruler size. The female is larger, the big ruler size, 25 to 40 centimeter. So, what is the exact scenario they are going to do? Now, we have the various way of manifestation of this disease. The larva, it can go affect the lung tissue, it can cause pneumonia. It's not a joke when I say worm infestation. Or the adult worms, the bigger ones, they can just go bring about either malnutrition because they are parasitic they are going to sit quietly keep on deriving everything from the adult or children whomever they are and they are going to have that allergic sort of reactions also then we have the wandering worms the smaller ones the worms they go either to the liver and there they are going to cause like abscess sort of formation so this is where the ascaris is quite little bit have to be taken into consideration. Now, what are the symptoms? Here, they might have sometimes present with fever, anorexia, loss of appetite. No, they don't like taking food. They'll have pain. Like, they'll have what you call a sort of constipation, like blockage. Bleeding sometimes will occur. The bleeding in the stools is very characteristic. Okay? So, that is very important. So, then we have... Uh, the life cycle of helminthic disease, we will see with it. So once, it is again the fecal oral route, contamination, contaminated food, contaminated water. So that is a source. So children, they play, they don't wash their hands, that hygiene is not proper, personal hygiene. So it just gets ingested. So the larva will hatch in the intestine, 
slowly they go into the lungs from the lungs through the alveoli bronchi all that it will come to the trachea from the trachea it will go to the pharynx okay from the pharynx it is again swallowed back entering your gi okay now what happens here they are going to develop those eggs are going to develop into a male and a female worms so the eggs in the female the fecal stage again they are going to fertilize and form the eggs so this is the diagnostic stage we say so then again in the external environment when when they come out in the fecal matter again two cell three cell they are going to divide again and again they are going to get ingested in the humans so like that it is going to go in a vicious manner and the person is going to get contracted with ascaris so what is happening first the infected form the larvae goes to the intestine from there the larva will reach the lung through the circulation then the trachea then the pharynx again back to gi uh, environment is there so there is development of these worms only this form might be very dangerous they can cause pneumonia here they are going to cause that intestinal blockage or malnutrition like that okay what about uh, this wandering worms smaller ones they can go affect liver also so once when they are ex so they will be passing that eggs in the stool like like they will be around some thousands of thing it's not a joke like they'll have thousands of egg been excreted out and those eggs when they hatch okay so what happens again that fertilized cell will be coming out then one the fertilized cell will be excreted out then two cell stage then they have lot of cleavages and again from them the larva the embryonated egg with second stage larva again they'll come out so like that they are going to have this so this is with the life cycle of ascaris lumbricoids so what are we going to do we are going to give them anti parasitic drugs mainly like albendazole i hope you would have heard about these drugs like ivermectin mebendazole these are the drugs depending on their body weight age we prescribe them so this is what we are not supposed to take just like that from the pres without prescription it's a prescription drug so it has to be taken under care okay so ascaris then we are going to have this i hope you all know this elephantiasis or filaria filariasis it's caused by the ucheria bancrofti it's also a filarial nematode ucheria bancrofti ucheria malai so what is happening again this helminthic infection is also spreading through the mosquito bite the culex mosquito which will carry this ucheria bancrofti and malai so what happens once when they bite their worms these filarial worms will go and lodge all the lymphatic vessels so once when the lymphatic drainage once when the lymphatic drainage is getting affected okay once when the lymphatic drainage is getting affected there will be enlargement of the limbs like that accumulation swelling edema which we say so sometimes edema of the limb even the groin scrotum okay even the mammary gland in the female cases we have seen so enlarged limbs and cracked skin so very characteristic okay so this edema swelling is what we observe okay so they have fever which we call it as the filarial fever so that is quite common so what is the treatment that we give so what is the name of that worm bucheria bancrofti it's a very important mcq ma they ask you filariasis or elephantiasis is caused due to the infection what parasitic infection bucheria bancrofti it's a mosquito borne disease culex mosquito so that is the one which causes it okay so they will have edema so what is the drug we give we give anti parasitic drugs mainly diethyl carbamazine and other anti worm like albendazole and all so main thing is environmental hygiene okay so we know the certain areas where there is a filarial outbreak so that environmental care has to be taken like avoiding stagnation of water or mosquito breeding all these things should be taken or they do reconstructive surgery okay and remove that affected tissue okay so because the appearance part is very disgusting so that is where they do that okay so now today we saw about the various fungal infection then we saw about the pyrion infection 
the protozoal infection, helminthic infection. Any doubt students? Shall we move on to the question session? Any doubts? Any doubts? So we saw malaria, yes. Then we saw about the entamoeba histolytica. Then we saw the trypanosoma gambusi. It's causing the sleeping sickness. Yes. Any doubts? Any doubts? Shall I proceed to our nice interactive question session? Yes. All are waiting. I am waiting specifically for that. Shall I move? Yes. You all able to follow ma so far? Yes. Everybody are able to follow? Yes. We will go for the question session. You are not able to follow. Any doubts are there? Nidarshana? Clear? Any doubts? Any doubts? Okay. Okay. Now, which is called as an opportunistic infection? Automycosis, candidiasis, athletes food, trichinellosis. I am waiting for your answer. Which is called an opportunistic infection? Please answer. Yes, excellent students, very good. The answer is candidiasis. What do you mean by candidiasis? Which I told it's called the oral thrush. Quite common, particularly in immune compromised people, particularly HIV, where they are more prone to develop all infection. And one among is the candidiasis. Excellent, excellent students. We will go to the next question. Which among the protozoan diseases has Monogenetic life cycle, Entamoeba histolytica, Giardella intestinalis, Plasmodium vivax, Leishmania donovani. What is the answer? Waiting. Yes. Yes, excellent. Very good. Keep it up. Very good. Yes, the answer is, let me wait for some more people to give. Yes, excellent. The answer is entamoeba histolytica. So, what is that? Yes, it is entamoeba histolytica because I told you it has got only single host to complete its life cycle. Whereas, look at these, they have digenetic host. In entamoeba histolytica, it is only single host, the man, yes, the human. So, that is the answer. Excellent, excellent students. Then we have this question, which medicine is extracted from the bark of chinchona tree? Malaria, leishmaniasis, trypanosomiasis, giardiasis. Waiting for your answers. Yes, come on. Yes, excellent students. The answer is yes. We will wait for some more people to answer. Yes, excellent. The answer is malaria. Yes, I already said that chloroquinone, the quinones, they are derived from the 
bark of this cinchona tree more commonly found in our india sri lanka and all so that is a particular drug those quinones are being derived and they are used to treat the malaria okay excellent so with this we are winding up the session 4 of today's class was it interesting you are all able to follow yes we saw about today the various diseases like particularly the fungal infections the ringworm tinea then we saw about the pyrion infectious disease like cru the laughing disease and the crucible jacob disease they are the proteinous abnormal proteins affecting the brain and blood cells particularly uh, the wbcs then we saw about the protozoan disease like malaria entamoeba histolytica yes and then we saw the african sleeping sickness also then we saw about the helminthic infections in helminthic infections we saw ascariasis and we saw another interesting filariasis okay and i want to wind up the session with with one thing like please children study hard work hard okay hard work never fails in life okay put your effort put your concentration and do well all the best thank you thank you students